Honorable Abdallah Kigoda, Minister for Industry, Trade and Marketing. Honorable Aidi Hautala, Finland's Minister for International Development. Honorable Alexander Stubb, Finland's Minister for European Affairs and Foreign Trade. Dr. Martin Ko, ED of the South Center. Professor Joseph Semboja, Chief Executive Officer of Wongos Institute. All of you, honorable ladies and gentlemen here gathered, all protocols observed. I feel honored and privileged by the invitation extended to me to open this round table discussion on development meets business revisiting Africa's relations with her partners, organized by the Institute of African Leadership for Sustainable Develop Development, commonly known as the Uongozi Institute. I commend the leadership and the entire management team of Uongozi Institute for organizing these forums which enable us to share experience and encourage debate. And in this particular case, to discuss the possible way forward for international partnerships and initiatives to better support Africa's developmental transformation. I would like to state how pleased and encouraged I am to see such a broad range of participants from civil society, public and private organizations in attendance for this important and timely roundtable discussion. I also take this opportunity to recognize the presence of representatives from the Finnish business community. Your attendance is testimony of the changing nature of cooperation between Africa and her partners that we are here to discuss today. This is also an opportunity for you to share experiences and expectations with your peers in the business community for mutual benefit. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a retiree, but I'm not the kind of retiree who knows everything and has plenty of time to tell you all about it. I don't know much, and certainly I don't have much time. I want very much to hear from you, because this is a rare opportunity in retirement to find such great minds and practitioners together. So I shall be very brief. And although my sons describe me as being of the 1947 generation, and they are of the digital generation, my presentation will not be a formal speech. It will take the form of bullet statements. To start with, the relationship between these parties, that is African countries and their partners, is one of dependence. At the official level, the dependence is mostly tilted in favor of Africa. Africa depends on its development partners for aid and budget support. At the same business, at, at the business level, because Africa has at best infant industries and are taking little value addition to its primary products, the relationship is a one-sided dependence. Business needs Africa's raw resources, Developed country business partners need Africa for their manufacturing and export industries, which is the mightier dependence I leave to you to tell me this afternoon. The global economic landscape has changed in the last decade, but the change started in the middle of the last century. Prior to that, the present day developed countries, especially Europe and America, owned, owned the economies of the present day developing countries, including Africa. Their businesses owned the raw materials and the markets of these countries. Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa should be a mandatory history and economics textbook in our colleges. The independence of African countries in the second half of the last century saw the gradual diminution of this ownership leading to the growing penetration of Africa of such countries as China, India, and other bigger non-aligned countries. A growing global economy needed a greater and wider resources base. The imploding demand for energy resources spotlighted the potential for investment in African countries, as did the hunger of the extractive industries in the developed countries. Because of the superabundance of oil, stroke, gas, and other strategic mineral resources, Africa is now profiled as a new investment frontier. The holiday economy 
deserves special attention. Africa's unspoiled nature, wildlife, and pristine beaches are driving major investments in tourism. The abundance of arable land is attracting a growing interest investment in investment in agricultural production and processing to meet a global burgeoning food need. This complex and rapidly unfolding scene in Africa calls for a critical re-examination of purpose, policy, promulgation, and provision of the aspiration of development and partnership. What kind of development? Development for whom? Under what conditions? I look forward to hearing from you. It is necessary to remind ourselves, however, that the purpose and target of development is people, not things. I get dismayed when I hear someone praise the development of Dar es Salaam, citing the mushrooming skyscrapers as evidence. To claim strides in urban housing development, there must be evidence of a mushrooming of a states of low-cost housing, privately or publicly funded, owner-occupier, architecturally designed, well-planned suburban growth. Does, does Islam look like that? City roads, cloaked, chock full of private cars, cannot be evidence of urban development when there is no statutory public transport system. The basic welfare of the people, of the most of the people, the majority of the people, the best wel welfare, the best welfare, must be the basic measure of development in our countries. In my view, development for poor countries means the eradication of ignorance, disease, and food insecurity. Official development assistance should be directed preponderantly on these targets, not the acquisition of modern, sophisticated weaponry for war. Can you imagine what development we would have had if official development assistance over the last 50 years had been directed to making sure that there are wells in every of those 12,000 villages in our country? That would be development. Ladies and gentlemen, in the early days of independence, African countries' state partners extended to the young states development loans because African countries quickly became choked by a huge debt regime, the phenomenon of official state loans has largely ceased. Lately, the impression has built up that African countries have been spoiled by official development assistance. The combination of misuse of aid and the curse of corruption warn that the development aid will decrease. This is reinforced by the economic crisis facing most country aid givers. I personally believe such aid decline is good because it will force African countries to make a reality of their often repeated policies of self-reliance. Besides, such a decline would increase the degree of independence and the dignity of statehood. Against the background of diminishing official loans and official aid, the private sector, both internal and external, assumes an overwhelming role in promoting economic growth and development. State revenues alone cannot fund the investment necessary to achieve sizable revenues to bear the cost of social development. It is recognized that genuine partnership can conduce to competitive growth, job creation, and enhancement of national wealth. In some sectors, the state will look to the private sector to embark on the ventures alone. In others, it will go in partnership with the private sector. Indeed, this latter is becoming the growing trend. It is called public-private partnership, PPP. This policy was reaffirmed recently by the Honorable Abdul Rahman Kinana, Secretary General of the ruling party, the CCM in Tanzania, in an address to Chief Executive Officers Roundtable. 
recognizing that PPPs are characterized by the sharing of investment, risk, responsibility, and reward between the partners. He stated that PPPs facilitate government's intentions to expand and improve the provision of infrastructures and other social services for their citizens. But he put a caveat. Provided they can appropriately combine the interests of the public and the private sectors. But there are prerequisites for successful partnership. The first is acknowledgement that the partners, all of them, or both partners, bring assets to the partnership. Land, financial, capital, technology, experience, etc. No one is coming to the partnership for a free ride. The value of those assets must be equitably determined, negotiations must not be forced, and the form and terms of partnership contract must be mutually agreed. Not all investors are thieves and charlatans, and not all African states are failed states. I say this particularly to my Tanzanian friends because the general tune here is to think every investor is coming to rob us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, additionally, African negotiating, negotiating teams need to do more by way of in-depth preparations for negotiation. The Swahili saying advises, don't join in a fight if you have no weapons. The projects they negotiate about are very complex indeed especially in these modern times, involving new explorations of technology, contract law, centers of arbitration and adjudication, interlocked markets, financial permutations, and corporate responsibilities. Their counterparts in the developed world are well prepared, strengthened as they often are by innumerable think tanks and in-house deliberations. The outcries one often hears about badly negotiated and signed contracts or trade and investment agreements are not always the product of the malevolence on the other side as the ignorance and misdirection on our part. This situation can be righted. I hope we can discuss it. Secondly, African countries need to improve their investment climate. They need to review periodically the administrative, commercial, and judicial environment to make it easy for investment and business is incontestable. I can state this with considerable certainty because I am co-chair of the Investment Climate Facility for Africa, a byproduct of the report of the Commission for Africa of a few years ago entitled Our Common Interest. That report found African countries wanting in facilitating local investable funds and foreign direct investment. It stressed that an improved investment climate is critical for job creation, income growth, and poverty reduction. By building effective coalitions with governments and business, we have at the ICF identified and implemented priority projects that drive the investment in African countries. As I speak to you, we have approved 56 projects, completed 24 projects, partnered 17 governments in 32 countries over the last six. Our development partners have come from the north, but I have already made a fleeting reference to the interest of BRICS and countries of the south to augment their trade and investment interest in Africa. South-South cooperation and partnership is an important dimension in Africa's quest for development. The executive director of the South Center, Dr. Martin Ko, will address this issue more knowledgeably than I can shortly, as I'm sure he will also touch on the role of the international financial and trade systems. Finally, partners embarking on negotiations must build and display respect and confidence in each other. Respect and confidence in each other. No side should be patronizing. No side should be mendicant. Financial capital is the accumulated savings of millions of people. Land and other natural resources are a people's patrimony. The interests of both sides must be harmonized and honored. In Africa's past, 
development has always been good for business. Now it is the turn of business to be good for development. Today's timely forum will be important for the future orientation of work in and for Africa. It behooves us to cooperate to address key development challenges for mutual benefit. A more prosperous, stable Africa, open to both North and South, is possible. I now declare the roundtable discussion open and thank you for your attention. Thank you.